Good morning, everybody. We have been looking at <clears throat> baptism the last uh, few weeks, understanding the action of it, understanding the purpose behind it, and today we're going to be looking at the subject on it. The reason why we are studying this is because we do have young people that are growing up within this church family uh, who need to learn about this, to understand it, to be able to apply it if they so desire. Uh, it is also something that we need to understand as it is a, it is a, a subject within the Bible. And if we are to teach the truth in its entirety, then we need to spend time here as well. And so we looked at a few weeks ago, we looked at baptism and the action. What did Jesus have in mind in Matthew 28 and also in Mark 16, as it was just read there, when he said, go and make disciples of all the nations by baptizing them and teaching them all that I've taught you. What is the action that Jesus had in mind when he said, hey, go and baptize them? Well, we looked at that and we understand that baptism here, that word means immersion. It means overwhelmed by water, to be submerged, to be plunged, to be dipped. Uh, in contrast to what a lot of people might think, that it is an understanding of sprinkling, that sprinkling can be involved as well. Well, we looked at this, we looked at all the different words, the Greek words that you have within that time that's referring to uh, washing or washing of the entirety of the body. And immersion is what baptism means. It has nothing to do with sprinkling water. We also looked at Romans 6 and 4 that says it's a burial which also helps us to, uh, that works and coincides with the idea of immersion, to be overwhelmed, to be plunged, to be dipped. Paul called it a burial in Romans chapter 6. A burial back then to cover with dirt or to enclose in a tomb works and works parallel to and synonymously to the idea of immersion. And then in Acts 22, to be overwhelmed by water, where we are going in, in Acts, chapter six, or Acts chapter 8, both Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water, and he was immersed there, and also Paul was immersed or washed or overwhelmed by water. If you've not been able to be here for the last few weeks uh, looking at baptism, these lessons are on our YouTube page, the Parker Church of Christ YouTube page, and you can go on there and look at the watch those lessons to kind of bring yourself up to speed here with these. So baptism, the action. Then we looked at baptism in the purpose or what happens when we are baptized. And here's where a lot of people miss a lot about what happens in immersion. So we spent some time here. One, Romans chapter six, when there's a burial here, there's a death and there's actually death to sin. We are dying to sin when we are immersed. Also in Romans chapter 6, 3 and following, you will see that when we are immersed in Christ, we are united with him in Christ with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Romans chapter 6, go and read that passage about that. Also, Mark 6, 15, 16, and also 1 Peter 3, 21 speaks about how baptism saves you. Baptism saves you. The words baptism and the word salvation there, the understanding of saved, are used together, are used together and describe salvation is found there in Christ through baptism. And then we looked at how we are then made a child of God. We are born, you've heard that phrase, born again. Well, born again is when we are immersed. Some people have the idea that born, being born again is just kind of a mental assent to that there is a God that I believe that Jesus is the Christ. But John is very specific about what that birth entails. It entails water and spirit. Galatians 3, 26, 27 says, For you have become children of God when you were immersed or clothed with Christ in baptism. So we become children of God. There's a change of our relationship. And then finally, we looked at in Acts chapter 2, verses 41, 47, and also 1 Corinthians 12, that when we are immersed, we are born again, and we're born into, are born as a child of God, and then we are born into those that are saved. We become part of those that are saved. 
Acts 2.41 and 2.47 speak to that. 1 Corinthians 12 says we are immersed into the body, into the body. Well, what's the body, Paul? Well, Paul tells us in Colossians that the body is the church and Jesus is the head of this body. So we think about a physical uh, body of Jesus being the head. Jesus is, it's his body. It's his head and the body there, then we are all, as Paul says, we are members of his body. And so we're added to the church. We are added to those that are saved. And so now we are gathering with those that are saved. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be not isolated from the world, but he wants us to also gather strength from one another in Christ. And so we're gathering together to be with the saved. And that what we see, that's what we see in Acts chapter 2, where 3,000 souls were added. Added to what? 47 says added to those who were saved. How were they added? They believed in Jesus Christ and they were immersed. They were baptized. And so they all hung out together, listening to further teaching of the apostles, giving each other clothing giving each other food, giving each other money, being with one another because they were like-minded. They had one mind, and that one mind was Christ. They also now are brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how we get the honor of talking to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ because we are born again into the family of God and we become his children. So now we're going to look at baptism and the subject. Who then is able to be immersed? Who is ready to be immersed into Christ? And so we're going to look at a few passages here to kind of discover here what exactly, who is, might be ready, who needs to uh, think about this and uh, understand the, the perspective of the person who is thinking about being immersed. So let's turn with, uh, in your Bibles first to Acts chapter 16. Turn with me to Acts chapter 16. <clears throat> And maybe a familiar uh, story to us where Paul and Silas uh, have been imprisoned for preaching Christ and they are in shackles. They are in a dungeon. When you think about the worst possible dungeon that maybe you've read about or seen in a movie, this is it. This is where Paul and Silas are. They are in the deepest, darkest dungeon reserved for the most heinous crimes during here in this Roman Empire. So then they're shackled. They're in the deepest part. It's, it's dark where they're at, verse 25. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. I don't know about you, but singing praises to God while I'm in a dungeon in a deep, dark pit, being shackled and hurt after being whipped, are you praising God for it? We have a hard time praising God when we go to work and have a difficult time, let alone being in prison in a dungeon. Yet this is what exactly what's happening here. This is a great uh, side story for us to think about what predicament are we in and are we complaining about today? Can we still praise God where we're at today no matter what our situation? So, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. Whether the jailer awoke, or excuse me, when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that prisoners had escaped. So during this time, just to give a little bit of background, those soldiers who were guarding the most heinous crimes guarded with their life. If they escaped, they would be killed. All right, they would be killed. They would be beaten and they would be killed. And so the honorable thing to do at that point was to take your own life because you messed up and you let these prisoners out. And so he's about ready to take his life. And so in verse 26, or excuse me, 28, but Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You see, the, the, the prison guard here, the jailer sees and, and experiences everything that happened. He sees the earthquake. He knows that all the jails and stuff, all the doors have come unhinged and opened up. And there's lots of people here that probably would take off. But he's also been hearing Paul and Silas sing praises to God. 
And the idea here with that praying and singing hymns of praise really has the idea when you look at the words here of singing a prayer to God. Singing a prayer to God. And this is what they're doing. And so he knows what they believe. He knows they believe in Jesus. He knows that they believe in God. And he knows that they're still there even though they could have taken off. Here's why they're here. Here's why they haven't taken off. Because here the jailer says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Verse 31, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Here is the first thought is you need to understand is you need to believe that Jesus is the son of God. You need to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And so what did they happen? It says, notice he says, and you will be saved. Okay, so then notice what happens here in verse 32. They don't just leave it there. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him. All right, we've looked at several other places. In Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading from Isaiah 53. And Philip comes up to the Ethiopian eunuch and says, hey, can I help you? And I'm, of course, I'm paraphrasing here. It's like, well, yeah, I'm reading this scripture. And, and, and is it talking about himself or is he talking about someone else? And from that scripture, Philip begins to preach what? He begins to preach Jesus to him. He preaches Jesus to him. In Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, those who had received his word were baptized. Whose word? Well, Peter is preaching there. He's preaching about Jesus. He's preaching about Jesus being the Son of God. Okay, this Jesus whom you crucified, he's talking to the house of Israel there in Acts chapter 2, and he preaches Jesus. So what's Paul do here? The same thing. He says, you need to believe that Jesus is uh, Lord. Believe in the Lord Jesus. So then he starts preaching about the Lord. Verse 32, and they spoke the, Lord, or the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he, that is the jailer, was immersed, was baptized, he and all his household. So he and all his household, they believed. You need to believe that Jesus is the Lord. Okay, let me preach to you about who Jesus is. Let me tell you about who he is. And then after, I don't need to talk so loud. We'll lower it down just a little bit now, right? After he teaches them about Jesus, what happens? The same thing that happens in Acts chapter 2 with the people who are listening to Peter preach about Jesus. The same thing that happens in Acts chapter 8 to the Ethiopian eunuch after Philip preaches Jesus. The same thing happens here. They hear the word and they are baptized, his and his household. So having believed, then look at that next verse there. In verse 34, and he brought them into his household, that is the jailer, brought them into his household, set food before them, that's talking about Paul and Silas, and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. So you have him and his household were baptized, and then him and his household rejoiced greatly. Why are they rejoicing? They believed that Jesus was the Lord. What does believing in Jesus as the Lord mean? Well, you know, Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 that I have come to seek and save whom? The lost. That which was lost. That's what Jesus came to do, seek and save the lost. Okay? When we are in our sins, we are separated from God. We are lost Church, visitors, we are lost. That's why in Acts chapter 2, when we looked at the, uh, the idea of the purpose of baptism, it says, for the forgiveness of sins. We need to be forgiven of our sins. That's part of the process and what happens in immersion. And so we are forgiven of those sins. And so they're rejoicing because they have been given the gift of Christ. They have been united with Christ. They have died to their sin. They've been buried with Christ. They've been added to those that are saved. They're excited, and what an amazing thing to be excited about. So they rejoice greatly. The subject for baptism is someone who believes. 
He says, believe and you will. So then they preach about Jesus and they're immersed and then they're saved. They're re they rejoice greatly. Now, one of the things that we want to just point out here is that they rejoice greatly. It says, them and their household. Now, one of the, the ideas or, or, or thoughts that, that is taught out in Christendom, uh, if you will, that in the household there probably was some, uh, some children. Maybe there were some infants there, and so they were all baptized. But it says the household rejoiced greatly. So the household that was immersed is also the household that rejoiced greatly. How is an infant going to understand that they need to rejoice after they've been baptized? A lot of babies that I've seen sprinkled on or immersed, they're crying. <laughs> they're not happy. Right? They're anything but, now that's not the rule, but they're anything but happy at those times. Guys, I think it's a very beautiful sentiment. It's a beautiful thought from a human perspective to want to dedicate your children to God. Okay? We want to dedicate our children to God, don't we? We want our children to be serving God. But immersing them or sprinkling them, they can't do this. They can't rejoice greatly because they have nothing to rejoice for. They don't understand where they're at. They can't make the decision there. They can't ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Notice, that's what happens in Acts chapter 2. Brethren, what must I do to be saved? And Peter tells them. Here the jailer says, what, what, what must I do to be saved? And Paul tells them. An infant can't ask that, answer that question. They're not a believer. Let's look at the next passage here that I want us to look at. Acts 2, verse 36 to 38. So turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, verse 36, uh, or as I've been telling you here, Peter is preaching to the house of Israel, that is the Jewish people there that are gathered together for the feast at Pentecost, and they've been hearing Peter preach about Jesus, okay? And this is one of the ones that I think, one of the areas that we struggle with today. So let me look at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He has just brought them up and preached them here, brought them to the point to understand that you, they now believe that Jesus is Lord. He references David as a prophet that spoke about Jesus. He talks about Jesus and the miracles that he performed, which they witnessed. Now they've come to the conclusion, they go, he is the Lord. And Peter says, and you're guilty of crucifying. You're responsible. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. This is something we struggle with today in our culture. It's not new. It's been around since the beginning. Of but our culture struggles with being pierced to the heart. Or let me back up. We get offended really easy about the wrong things and not about the right things. Right? Right? We're not, we don't like to feel guilt. Guilt is not a good thing. We don't want to talk about guilt. All right? We just talk about you offended me, and so that makes me feel bad, and so now I'm going to attack you. If we were to say in this, if we were to talk about this idea of you crucified Jesus, I didn't do that. What are you talking about? We would get offended, and we would attack the person who was telling us that. Because we have missed, we have missed having a heart of understanding that when we're wrong, we need to make it right. We've come to a place where I don't care if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, then I, wanna, I don't want to be right. Isn't that one, one of our, our chants and our, our calls now? We have a difficult time being pierced to the Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 
for kind of a, a good illustration of what this means. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul has written a letter and now a second letter to the church at Corinth calling them out on their sin. Calling them out on what they've been doing wrong. Okay, he's called them out on all of these things here. And so now look at verse 8 of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul is talking to the church. He says, For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, because I was calling you out on what you were doing wrong. He says, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. What's Paul saying here? You know, sometimes it's difficult to call people out when they're wrong, right? And when we do, their response might be to kind of feel horrible. And then, and then in some circumstances, we might think, oh, man, I, I just wanted to point out what was wrong. I didn't want you to, to cause you this much pain. And so Paul is saying, I don't regret it because it was the right thing to do. And you felt sorrow in, in a right way. But I also feel bad because it did cause you sorrow. And Paul's a compassionate person. Paul has a love for the church. Okay, He wants to do right by the church. But then going on, then look at verse 9. I now rejoice, though, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For listen here, verse 10, guys, this is key to understanding this pierce to the heart that's happening in Acts chapter 2. This is what's happening here in verse 10. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, notice here, leading to salvation. But... The sorrow of the world produces death. So here, here's the difference here. The sorrow of the world, and just kind of put it in, in a little, uh, a quick nutshell here, here. Sorrow of the world. Our children, when we talk to them about something they've done to one of their siblings, right? And we go, you need to go and apologize to your sister or to your brother. <sighs> Sorry. Sorrow of the world. That's sorrow of the world. We're doing it because, yeah, I got to do it. I got to feel that. I got, you know, that's that sorrow. We're more upset that we got caught than actually guilty of what we've done, right? The sorrow here that Paul is talking about that leads to repentance is an understanding of what you've really done. And ultimately, it is like the heart of David when he understands that he sinned first and foremost against God. We forget in our sin that while we may have offended somebody, we may have hurt somebody, we've offended God first and foremost. That is the godly sorrow that understands I truly have done something wrong and I'm guilty of it and I need to make it right. I need to make it right. That's the next part is we need to make it right, okay? So here, <clears throat> baptism, the subject, is someone who's also a convicted believer. Someone who understands where they are at without Christ. The people in Acts chapter 2 understood where they were at without Christ when they said, okay, what do we need to do to be saved then? I want to understand how to make this right to correct the problem because I am guilty. It is difficult in today's society to be told that we're wrong. We don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that I've, been, I've done something wrong. Who does? But what do we do when we are told? Are we offended? Or are we pierced? Are we pierced? The next thing I want to look at also right here in Acts chapter 238. Okay? So they ask them, brethren, what shall we do? Back in Acts chapter 2. And Peter says, 
Peter says, repent, right? Repent and each of you be baptized. Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized. Here is the next thing that we struggle with as a believer who is considering, who's thinking about immersion, about being baptized, is now we've understood, okay, now I've done something wrong. Now I've sinned. We don't like that word either here, right? We've sinned. We've made a mistake. We've, we've messed up. We're guilty of it. But now we have to stop it. That's the next most difficult thing, right? First, we don't want to be told that we're wrong. Then we don't want to tell, be told, and we have to stop doing that. Doesn't mean we're going to perf be perfect from then on out. But repentance means then that we're walking away from that sin or that lifestyle or that what got us into the, into the dip difficult situation to begin with and walk away from it. Repentance, which is interesting because, well, let me hold that thought. Let me get to this one. My next thought, the thought I was just talking about is the next one after that. Turn with me to Matthew. Notice something in Matthew chapter 3 that gives us a good illustration. Matthew chapter 3. Now here, John the Immerser, or as you might know him as the baptizer, Right? John the Immerser is, is, is baptizing people here, and there is still the same uh, um, precedent that John is preaching about here in uh, Matthew chapter 3. Now let's just start with verse 4. Matthew 3, ver Matthew 3 verse 4. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was in wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from a wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father, for I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. What does, now look at verse, verse 11. As for me, I says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. John, John denies baptism for those Pharisees and those leaders that were coming to be baptized. Why? Because they weren't repenting. They were coming there ultimately for the look, for the scene, to be seen amongst other people as they were coming out to be prominent amongst the other people as leaders. John saw right through it. He says, I'm not going to allow you guys to be immersed. You guys aren't showing any fruit of repentance. Repentance is walking away from the sin that we were so fixed in, that got us into the problem to begin with. And so the believer is also a convicted penitent believer. The believer that is ready to be immersed is someone who believes, someone who is <clears throat> convicted of where they are, and then someone who is ready to repent of where they've been. So then the convicted, penitent believer is pierced to the heart, is repented, and notice then in all of these things how baptism is a nice conclusion to where we start with our understanding of sin. Sin, when we are corrected, our response then is, like the people in Peter's talking to, they were pierced to the heart. They understood that what they did was wrong. And so then Peter says, when they understood what was wrong, they said, okay. Peter said, okay, now you need to repent and each of you be baptized. So repent is a walking away from the sin. And then baptism is a death to sin. See how the steps work right in line with that understanding? 
of, but we need, brethren, we can't be saved if we don't understand sin. Did you hear that? We can't be immersed for the forgiveness of sins if we don't understand that we are in sin. And the world doesn't want to hear that. And maybe you don't want to hear that this morning. But we do. We fail. We fail. But thanks to God in His grace, that's not where our story ends. But we need to understand that we, you know, I, I've used this illustration before with my children. And, and, and I, I think it, it works well, so I'll go ahead and use it again. For those of you that heard, heard it before, uh, tough. For those of you who haven't heard it, then maybe it'll, it'll be good. You know, a lot of people know before I it was a, a minister, I worked in retail clothing. And one of my big pet peeves was the kids running in and out of those rounder, the clothes rounder rings, right? They're in and out. They're knocking over clothes. I just have to go over there and pick them up and hang them up and, and talk politely to the kids because, you know, the parents are just letting their kids run all over. So hard to believe my children were doing this. They were at a store, and they're running all over the place, right? Well, what happens when you run from one rounder when you're on your your hands and knees and you go from one rounder to the next and then you go to the next and then you go to the next and all of a sudden you pop up and you're like, where's mom and dad? Yeah, no big deal. So mom and dad are like, hey, kids, where are you? Why do you need to know where I am? You know, we're walking around. We're starting to get a little, you know, a little bit uh, scared here. There's lots of people around here, right? We don't want our kids to be kidnapped. So we're walking around trying to be, you know, discreet with calling out our kids, you know, and not, we don't want everybody to go, oh, their kids are lost. You know, those guys, people letting their kids running through those clothes rounders. But here's the problem. My kids were off in another department. Guess what they didn't know? that they were lost because they weren't around us. So as I went looking for them, I'm trying to save them in my mind, but they don't know that they're lost. So how can they be found if they don't know that they're lost? Or how do they look to someone to save them if they don't know that they're lost? They won't. It's the same thing for us in our relationship to God. If we don't know that we're lost without God, God cannot save us. That's why, it under, that's why it starts with understanding where we're at. That's why Peter said there at the end, I brought you up to understand Jesus and who he is and what he can do for you. But here's what you've done. You are guilty of crucifying him. And they were pierced to the heart. And they said, what do we do? Peter said, repent and be buried, putting death to your sin and be made new. Be a child of mine. Be added to those that are saved. Be added to the gathering of the saints. When you understand and you read God's word, it all makes sense. And it all connects. And when you understand sin, then baptism becomes much more understandable and then the realization of it being necessary. If, if 1 Peter 3 was never put in there, if Mark 16 was never put in there, it says, and those that were baptized and believed were saved, if that was never in there, we would still understand that this is a necessity to our sin. Wouldn't we see that as necessary? Why? Because we understand our place in sin. We're pierced to the heart. We understand what we need to do with sin. We're repented. And now we need to know that we need to die to it. In order for us in Romans chapter 6 to live to Christ. Study these out for yourself. Study these passages. I've told you before, never just take my word and not do more studying yourself.
Please don't ever do that with any lesson that you hear from up here. Don't just sit there and take it and go, oh, yeah, he's right, he's right, without studying it yourself. Okay? You, one of the things, you've got to be convicted. I am convicted of this, but I cannot be convicted for you, nor can anybody else. Jesus is calling to you. Jesus wants you to come to him and be a child of his. Jesus wants you to be saved. He wants you to be a child of his father. He wants you to be forgiven of your sins. He wants you to be a disciple of his by being immersed and being taught. If you've not yet done this and you're still thinking about this, uh, please let us know. We'd love to sit down and study with you some more about this. But as the Ethiopian eunuch said, look, there's water. What prevents me from being immersed? We have water over here that you could be buried in for the forgiveness of your sins and be added to the church today if you so chose. If you're struggling with something else and you want the prayers of this congregation, maybe you are struggling with temptation or sin in your life and you need the prayers of the congregation, please come forward as together we stand and sing.